place to wrap up the the uh, talk portion of the Santa Fe virtual Santa Fe meeting uh, with Michael Grafbohm from the University of Liverpool, and he's going to be discussing improving the productivity of paleomagnetic laboratories on ongoing advancements and challenges in paleomagnetic instrumentation. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Yes. Okay. So I am giving the last talk here, it turns out. Um, and with the nice little time change, it is also probably my last activity of the day. So I'd like to take the opportunity to expand on what Dave has just talked about with his new magnetometer system and delve deeper into the systems that we all take for granted and also, in a sense, rule our lives. It's hard to go to any conference without the word rapid or SRM or JR6 being thrown around consistently. So today, I'll go a little bit over how paleomagnetic equipment has evolved over time, specifically in terms of automation, which I know is something that everyone appreciates. We'll talk about the current paleomagnetic equipment, which generally is dominated by fluxgate magnetometers and squid magnetometer systems, how we can push paleomagnetic equipment forward, whether that's um, higher resolution, lower noise, a lower cost in the case of the OPRM, for example, or get faster data. So maybe something faster than the rapid, for example. So just to start off, I think it's important to go back to our roots. On the left side, you see an old A-static magnetometer system that is over 80 years old. And this system used magnets that were suspended um, and allowed to move freely. So when a magnetic field, a magnetic sample got put near them, they moved and that movement got registered as a change, and that was what was measured. And then going forward, the first flux gate magnetometers were critical during World War II. As many people know, that's how we got a lot of the seafloor maps as a result of World War II and the work done with magnetometer systems then. And then going forward, we have on the left side, our favorite squid magnetometers. Um, this is an example of a DC biased squid as it has two weak points in the superconducting loop. You can also get cheaper ones that only have one weakness in the superconducting loop. And the fun part about these, of course, is that they do require um, superconducting temperatures and so when they came out, the consumption of liquid helium and liquid nitrogen later really went up for paleomagnetists. And that has always been something that is always present in a lot of paleomag labs is that constant squeak of the cryo cooler every 0.9 seconds, which most of us have probably tuned out until a visitor comes and says, what's that noise? Then it's like, oh yeah, that's still there, isn't that? And then, New equipment that has come out more recently are the quantum diamond magnetometer systems, the magneto impedance sensors, of course, the optically pumped magnetometer system. And then on the flip side, you also have other systems that can measure larger magnetic fields, such as the proton precession ones or hull probes, if you want to go a completely different direction and you want to measure actual iron, you'll need a hall probe for that. And it, it would just completely saturate uh, the squid magnetometers that we hold so dear to our hearts as anyone knows who has tried to do something like that. So in terms of the modern equipment that we have, we have option one. So it's very robust and work intensive such as the JR6 example that was brought up at the very end of the previous one. 
And as a rule of thumb, it takes about five minutes per specimen per step. And so 10 specimens, 10 steps, 500 minutes of measuring, plus the heating time. So this is definitely something that is work intensive because you still need all the heating components, but you also need just a lot of time just to sit there and do it. But there is one huge advantage to it, and it is that these systems, especially the JR6, are extremely robust. For example, if you shut down the lab for four months and then decide that, oh, we should go back in. I hope the equipment's working. JR6 works great. It's especially good when supply chains are down because you know, that's been known to happen once or twice. The flip side is you can get very fast equipment that is very reliable and very high resolution. It gives great data. The rapid system that we have in Liverpool takes about two minutes per specimen per step. And so for that same example of 10 steps with uh, 10 specimens, 200 minutes of automated measuring, but it's automated. So that's 200 minutes that someone does not have to sit there and flip samples. But the downside is, of course, you still have that heating time. So someone still has to go in and switch the samples from the oven to the magnetometer and back. But these are pieces of equipment that are ubiquitous. They are extremely important, these squid magnetometer systems. And the flip side to that is, OK, we know the system. We love the system. In Liverpool in particular, we have a microwave magnetometer system. And this one is just used as an example of a system that can run paleo intensity experiments or paleo direction experiments individually in situ. And it takes about one hour for the total experiment, or about 10 hours for the same example. And the system is set up relatively similarly to how the rapid is set up, where instead of a inline AFD mag coil, there is an inline microwave radiation cavity. And so my goal during my PhD was to try to push paleomagnetic equipment forward based on what we currently have and see, can I take the best parts of both and merge them all together into something new? So the directions are faster collection, technically simpler, lower cost. See what we can do with that. So in the faster data collection side, that was where my magnetometer came in called SMARTER. So it's the superconducting magnetometer for the automated recording of thermal remnants. If anyone knows Greg Patterson, um, that type of acronym has his name written all over it. He is my inspiration for naming things. The main advantage of this one is the automated control system where it can run the experiment in situ, like the microwave system but it will heat and measure automatically. And over the course of about 30 minutes, a um, thermal demagnetization can happen up to a temperature of about 500 degrees um, in 30 degree temperature steps. The important parts of the magnetometer are noted on the right. There is a non-magnetic quad pod that holds the actuator which is a necessity for anything that's going to move. And is, of course, the biggest source of magnetic noise. Then the sensors themselves sit inside of the mu metal shielding. And it gives full vector three axis magnetic data using three um, RF squid magnetometers that are that sit in a bath of liquid nitrogen. And as we go inside Smarter, there are two setups. You can either run using two squids or three squids. And 
the use of the RF squids means that for price tag, it sits between um, the spinner and a rapid. And the cost also sits between those two. Given that this was a research project, the cost was substantially higher because I was an international student and my tuition was quite high, but that was not something we had to directly pay. So it's unclear exactly how much one of these costs. The design of it allows eight to 20 millimeter diameter specimens to be used with 10 millimeter was generally the preferred size to ensure that there is this sufficient signal without uh, saturating the squids. And on the right side, you can see a simplified CAD drawing of the internals. And in the middle is the aluminum top plate that is one of the most important parts of the system because it separates the cryogenics from the, um, from the atmosphere and the room conditions. It gives okay data as it stands. The vector demagnetization plots are relatively straightforward, where the goal was to try to pull out a um, inclination of 90 degrees. And we compared with the same specimens um, on the rapid. These are basalt specimens from Hawaii. And rapid, beautiful data, as always. And the flip side to that <clears throat> is the smarter data gave a much higher circular error, but the error bound does include um, the inclination equals 90 degree point. And this direction was particularly uh, selected because we were running it in two squid mode and the orientation of the squid is such that they measure a convolution of XYZ data. And so trying to pull out something that is straight down is a degenerative case and so is the hardest case. And this way can give a sense of what the worst case scenario would be. And the answer is no, it does not replace a rapid, but since it runs each specimen um, individually, it gives a good first order estimate that can then be used to determine, okay, is it even worth our time to spend more time on this site? So there's a second direction that we can take it. And that would be to do something that's technically simpler. And the main advantage of this is lower maintenance costs. Potentially the equipment is more versatile. There are multiple directions that you could take it, such as the magneto impedance sensor or the OPRM from the previous talk. I hope you were there. Or there is the potential to have more applications for flux gates. In the bottom right is an example of a system I worked on when I was an undergrad uh, at Caltech working with uh, Joe Kirschfink and Roger Fu. And this system was able to do a XY raster automatically and the Z axis could be changed manually. And the flux gate sensor was moved in this case across um, rock faces and old neck heads, I believe, in Guatemala. And these, um, the advantage of this system, of course, is we were able to run it actually in the field on everything. We'd never had to take any samples, which is also a big bonus if the place you're going, A, has samples that don't require a uh, substantial demagnetization process. And if you're going somewhere that doesn't want you drilling, which who's ever heard of somewhere like that? The third direction um, is to go just straight up lower cost. And the lower cost and the technically simpler, those tend to go hand in hand. Um, but 
the other advantage of specifically aiming for a lower cost is that it potentially expands access to the equipment where it's really great that we have the rapid system, that that is something that exists. It gives great data. Um, it, it, many laboratories use it and have used it for decades. It's proven technology. But in other laboratories, it just is the case where they can't afford it or they have the person power, or I guess I should say the undergraduate power, for example, to run the JR6s continuously. And so that's where flux gate magnetometer systems come in, where the best flux gate magnetometers tend are approaching the uh, noise levels of the worst squid sensors. So they are about um, an order of magnitude off some maybe two orders of magnitude off some of the um, better squids, uh, given that they are in the single digit um, peta tesla and they need to get down to the femto tesla per, per square root hertz to be directly comparable to the squid sensors. But there be that multiple sensors could be used at different distances or moving the sample around if that would be another way to go to reduce that noise level by simply increasing the number of data points. And with flux gates, that tends to actually be quite possible given that they're smaller, they're simpler, they don't have the requirements that squids do, and they're cheaper. So you can get several flux gates for the price of one squid. Then, one other aspect of this is that the equipment doesn't exist in a vacuum. Paleo intensity techniques, specifically Tellier style paleo intensity experiments, one of the things that's always important is to include the extra checks to make sure that the data that you're pulling out are good. PTRM checks and tail checks, for example. The um, control system on Smarter is not capable of running Tellier style pale intensity experiment because some force majeure for about six months last year prevented me from being in the lab for the last half year of my PhD thesis. So that is a ongoing part with Smarter to smarten the control system within it. The flip side to that is it also means that paleo intensity experiments done traditionally can get very long, where you add in these extra checks. So that means instead of a direction experiment where you go to each temperature one time, for paleo intensities, you on average go to a temperature two and a half, three times or more, depending on how many extra checks you add, which then has the logical follow-up question do we do too many checks? Are we introducing more, um, more thermochemical alteration as a result of all these repeated heatings? And that's where a flexible system can come in. Something, for example, where the rapid is capable of measuring susceptibility. Um, if the susceptibility meter is properly placed as the as the control system likes to remind us. And adding those extra components can also help measure it and check that for us automatically. Then you can also take it in a completely different direction as Liverpool does and suggest you do away with thermal radiation entirely and replace it with a higher frequency radiation, microwave radiation. But as this is the last talk, I will try to avoid starting much controversy. And the other part of that is, okay, do we necessarily need the equipment to do all these extra steps for us? Or can we rely on the statistics that community has put forward, such as the QPI criteria that Andy Biggin, my supervisor, and Greg had put forward? Also with that, um, maybe 
do we want to go down other methods? They are not as tested and true, but they sometimes give data where Tellier does not. Is that data reliable? That is definitely something up for debate, but it is a alternative direction that one could look at when coupling it with equipment, depending on the equipment's capabilities. So the open questions going forward, are squids on the way out? Uh, what's the other path? There are lots of great technologies that could be doing it. How can we maximize automation? Everyone likes more automation. It gives us more time to do literally anything else except to sit there and flip samples. Do we still need to push the methodology forward? Because no matter how great the equipment is, if we're doing a flawed experiment, is it any good? Can QPI criteria and other statistics help us? Can we figure out something to sidestep the problem of equipment and just rely on processing power to parse the correct answer? So in summary, paleomagnetic equipment continues to evolve. Current equipment is quite complex, but generally, we know how to fix it because usually someone has had the problem for us. Just check the uh, rapid mailing list. Better equipment doesn't necessarily only mean higher resolution. And the best equipment is tied to the techniques that you want to run and the actual people doing it. Thank you for listening. Great, thanks, Michael. That's a nice overview. Uh, do we have any questions for for Michael? So I like your your smarter system is very impressive. I like the idea of so you can just set up a thermal DMAG and it'll it'll measure and heat and measure and heat while you're off playing outside. Is that right? Yes. Um, I don't currently recommend it being left unattended by virtue of it being a prototype. And so the I have never in this system, once it has been fixed, caught anything on fire with it, but Good job. Um, it still has um, 500 degrees sitting there. Yeah. So how often do you have to refill the, the nitrogen? It being a prototype, it still. We have a autofill system that oh. refills it nightly, um, oh, but right. it does, I guess refills the wrong word. It tops it up nightly. Right. Um, so it's a 10 liter doer and it tops it up with about three or four liters every night as a vague estimate. Perfect. Uh, yeah, because I hit that, well, maybe that's the limiting factor of having to attend to it ultimately, but you've got that covered, so. Uh, Pete, Pete has a question. Pete Solhide. Hi. Yeah. Just uh, thanks. Yeah, it was a nice overview of, of where things are and where things are going. Um, quick question about the the, the nitrogen-based squids. Do they have yep. a lot of drift? Um, the drift over an experiment tends not to be too substantial. Um, the Main factor, of course, is temperature changes and nitrogen bubbles forming because the nitrogen is constantly boiling off. Um, so as a partial remedy to that, the squid holder has nucleation points along the top to preferentially nucleate there. And the since this was made just using um, off-the-shelf components, the um, there's a separate control system for the squids to the automated system. So the, so the lab view based control circuit has to talk to the squid system that has to then control the squids. But that squid control system, because prototype, um, can adjust in real time the squid offset. And during each heating step, it can reset the squids and adjust that offset to account for any linear drift. And is the drift that you see mostly linear or? Yes, usually it's just a offset drift. It's um, 
uncommon that during an experiment, the um, actual RC, the LC circuit needs to be changed to get the correct frequency. It's usually just the offset. Cool, thanks. Do you think there's room for improvement in the, the kind of quality of the directions there, or is that kind of a limitation of the system? So the system, of course, inherited pieces from a earlier system that wanted to do this continuously. And when doing it continuously, one of the aspects that was required was a solenoid that was near the squids. And so that necessitated for uh, background field reasons to use squids that were arranged in a circle. And so one of the biggest things that would fix uh, the noise problem, at least somewhat, would be to return to a normal configuration of having the squid simply in an XYZ orientation, because that would remove the need to deconvolute the signals, and it would remove the need to um, make several assumptions about the size of the sample and the location of the sample within the actual measurement zone. So yes, in summary, I think the um, directions should be able to be improved. Great, thank you. Do you have any other questions? I have a question. So if, yep. if you're measuring at temperature, the MS of the constituent minerals is going to be going down with increased temperature. Yep. So do you need to think at all about how you present the data and how you're interpreting the data with respect to traditional thermal demagnetization measurements where you're going back up to room temperature each time and MS is in theory staying similar? Uh, there is the potential for that need. Um, I don't necessarily think that the traditional Ziderfeld style plot is necessarily correct on that point. Uh, the Extracted direction, though, um, I think on a traditional equal area plot should still be fine uh, because it's giving that average result. The other caveat is um, since the sample moves from the heating zone to the measurement zone, the temperature does decrease, and that decrease is known. And so it creates a more complicated aspect with uh, that side of it. Um, but that isn't something that I have looked into, but is a, a good point of something that does need to be kept in mind for a more robust interpretation of the data. Thanks. All right, I guess last, last chance for questions. Michael, just very, very quickly. So you show the worst. You can also case, always uh, email me. I'm pretty good at responding. <laughs> can I can I go on and ask the question? Yeah. So you, you show the worst case uh, comparison with a two squid uh, compared to the the rapid. How does yep. it compare when you use a free squid geometry if you've done the, those measurements? And I'm also assuming that the comparison you showed is for the same number of specimens and measurements. Uh, so it was the same amount of time. So the hmm. rapid data um, is, I believe, five specimens. And it's, I gathered these five specimens on the rapid in the same time that I gathered um, 15 on Smarter. Hmm. So instead of the same number, it's the same time, because that is one of the major points of it. Um, in terms of using three squids, um, with the equipment setup that we have, it proved too difficult to do because this system evolved from a single axis system that had a manual squid control. And we had a one axis manual and a two axis automatic. And so what it meant was that those drifts that were being done by the computer while the computer was dealing with two of them, I had to deal with the third. And that was not a setup that was tenable for me because between 
given the short time period between each one, I couldn't keep up with the offset in the way that the computer could. Um, that just proved to be untenable. So with three squids, um, it should improve it, but with them in the current configuration that was inherited from the old system, this would still be the worst case scenario because you would still have that issue of the degenerate case where it's just going straight down and they're all trying to measure the same thing. Okay, thank you.